Um, I would like to call the word the 69th uh, public meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on June 13, 2013. Um, I'd like to start the day by uh, remembering Governor Paul Salucci. Uh, Governor Salucci um, did me the honor of asking me to serve as Secretary of Administration and Finance in his administration in 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, he was a guy uh, had a, uh, an unusual combination of, of integrity about his convictions and the courage to act them out. He was very conservative on issues like taxes and budget, but also incredibly progressive about issues like um, conservation and, and uh, domestic violence, all kinds of women's rights issues. It was a really unusual combination and, uh, and a guy who was really comfortable in his own skin about being who he was. Uh, all know he got uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and had a terrible last few years. Um, and his wife, had, Jan, had to be a caretaker. So I just wanted to have a moment of, uh, of silence in memory of Governor Salucci and on behalf of his wife, Jan Salucci. like to add, he did me the honor of appointing me to the appeals court, and uh, although I didn't know him nearly as well as you did, I think that your characterization of him was uh, spot on. Particularly impressive, I think, was his uh, comfort in his own skin, but his humility, his, his, uh, uh, his um, execution of his duties as, a, as governor without ever losing touch with who he was or where he came from. Or, of the community in which he lived, and he was a remarkable guy. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I would remind people, if you've forgotten, he appointed Margie Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. who was an extraordinary justice, among other things, doing the extraordinary gay rights, uh, gay marriage decision um, that was earth-shattering. And this was a so-called conservative Republican governor who appointed Margaret Marshall as Supreme Court Justice. You know, he was, he's quite a them also, I guess, with others here who worked with them, Janice, Janice, yeah, Ellen, yeah. Um, so thank you all. Okay, um, we're going to move on. If I get over the goosebumps um, and do the approval of the minutes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would. Uh, the minutes are in the meeting packet. Uh, uh, once again, a reminder that they are uh, online. Uh, Link directly to the video of our meetings, um, but uh, here we are in, in printed form, and I'd uh, move uh, that they be approved in the form submitted. Do I have a second? Second. Um, I just on discussion um, on page five, uh, Commissioner. Maybe somebody knows something I don't know, including maybe uh, uh, Artem. But it says, although the commission does not anticipate asking questions, it may ask clarificatory questions. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> <laughs> Clarifying, maybe? I don't know. I've never heard of clarificatory, but no. we'll, 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 no, we'll change that, Mr. Chair. Other than that, um, <laughs> all in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? They are accepted unanimously. Um, all right, uh, for the rest of the clarificatory afternoon, uh, <laughs> for the first, we'll move to uh, administrative issues and ask Executive Director Daly to take the floor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Uh, oh, excuse me, just one thing I wanted to mention. Um, we have talked about, for the, for the people who are here, we've talked about wanting to give you the tools to work along with us, and uh, we talked about um, passing out all, we, we've been given the background materials that are in our packet to the press and a few extra copies we had to give to people. And we talked about giving everybody copies of our materials, but they are so voluminous, as you can see, that we decided that was pretty inefficient. So everything will be on, on the uh, uh, screen. So you will be able to see what we're talking about. I, was, I realize during one of these most recent meetings that lots of times folks are sitting there in the audience watching, watching us talk about stuff and no idea 
what it is because it's not in front of you. So hopefully this will be helpful. Um, but we want to make your time as efficient as possible. So if this doesn't work, you know, let us know. But this is an attempt to have you help have you be able to work along with this. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a quick note on the future that our uh, commission's next meeting is uh, June 27th. And most of our agenda should be consideration of Category 2 investigations and suitability recommendations uh, by the by EB. Uh, category category two, 2 recommendations. Right. recommendations. Uh, then uh, what I'd like to do is briefly update uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the commission, that uh, Com Commissioner Zuniga, McHugh, uh, Stebbins, and I have, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, Commissioner Zuniga and McHugh and I have started interviews on our Chief Information Officer position, Head of Technology. And uh, based on what we've seen so far, we think we're going to have an excellent group. Of, we've got over 100 candidates uh, to choose from, but what we've seen so far, we think we're going to have an excellent group to uh, come up with a good person for the Commission. Secondly, uh, Commissioner Zuniga and McHugh, Stebbins and I, uh, are continuing to develop resources to allow the commissioners uh, to add areas of expertise during the evaluation of applicants, applications. The financial advisor RFR responses are due June 28th. The building and site design RFR release we plan June 21st at least. Uh, economic development uh, RFR draft is uh, to be prepared by June 21st and released by June 28th. The project manager coordinator RFR release uh, we plan by June 14th, which is tomorrow. Uh, and uh, with the three weeks response period, we anticipate being able to review the responses the week of July 8th. Uh, the target overall for the project manager interviews is the period of July 15th through the 22nd uh, to allow a recommendation for the commission on July 25th at its commission meeting. Uh, the project manager initial duties will include assisting the selection uh, of additional advisors and Hopefully that package will be completed before the end of August, once again, to be able to move uh, to the commissioners for your review and, and hopefully approval. Well, the concept is to have the project manager and advisor selected and ready to participate in sort of an organizational process and practice discussions in September uh, so that the teams are ready uh, and prepared to make decisions and evaluate the Category 2 application when that period closes in, in the first week of October. John Ziemba is also exploring the possible assistance from Massachusetts Transportation and Environmental Affairs Agencies. And uh, uh, I believe Commissioner Stebbins and McHugh have had an additional context, and perhaps uh, Commissioner McHugh can, would be willing to respond or comment on that topic. But that should provide at least a perspective and, and a plan and, and the target dates that we have as we look forward. Great. Did, did you want? Mr. McHugh. Well, we're, we're, we're also uh, talking to um, those who are not going to be part of the um, uh, formal team that we assemble, but uh, uh, people uh, such as representatives from DOER, the AIA, and others who may be able to assist us in some voluntary way, either in uh, vetting uh, people uh, who will uh, be in, uh, uh, potentially hired to respond to the IFRs or otherwise reviewing documents and helping us look at uh, uh, look at um, parts of the application and assisting us with the application process. So we're in the process now of trying to talk to them and see what it is uh, that they'd be willing to do and, and uh, on what kind of a schedule I think we'll be able to get some really very valuable <coughs> help from them in, in this process. Okay. Um, I, I find myself not exactly clear on the project manager role. Um, so I know you define, you said, we've talked about it and you said something about what you saw, but sort of tell me again, one, once the person's up and running um, and the process is going on, what do you see that person's job as? Primarily, and this, this would be at first anyway, but the initial, um, their initial task will be to assist uh, us in making sure we have sufficient expertise so they'll help screen and, and interview uh, those that, have, that we're prepared to look at for other areas of expertise, um, environmental impact, uh, traffic, those kind of things. So that will be the first job. The second job will be actually to, to help move, make sure the process moves forward because the evaluation teams have you know, five separate uh, processes and to be able to at least uh, help keep track of how things are going in that process, probably interface with the experts that are on each one of the evaluation teams, not 
uh, this person wouldn't be required to sit at each meeting, but obviously in order to do that, it makes sense to at least spend some time with each evaluation team uh, and in the end uh, would be instrumental in helping bring forward the recommendations uh, that each of the team have made to have them prepared and ready uh, for the Commission's consideration uh, when the product is ready. Does it seem completely clear to all of you that that's a, a role that we need additional help for? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so, too. Okay. Um, there's going to be a lot of moving parts in this process once we get going, and we've got a very short time to do it. And somebody who is devoted full-time to coordinating among the five teams, I think, is essential to make it succeed. So, and you, you feel the same way? Well, uh, yeah, for the most part, I will, I will say I think that the need is there. The coordination need is, is, is clearly uh, the, the, the time frames are tight, uh, mm -hmm. the tasks are many. Uh, um, so I, I, I really think we, we need a coordinating piece. I, I brought up the point a little while ago, and I guess uh, there was not a lot of consensus around an alternative, like um, having a member of each of the five teams come into a steering committee of sorts, a coordinating committee. Uh, but that, you know, that also carries some, some you know, um, things to consider. Uh, I, I think uh, that, would, that person, that if there were such a thing, that right. there would be the, this project manager still. There's still a role for somebody yeah. to yeah. keep. Uh, uh, you know, we we, uh, <coughs> we do anticipate that there will be a lot of uh, information back and forth, um, starting as early as prior to the deadlines. Um, um, to your point about having somebody on board in September, early <coughs> September, uh, there could be questions. Uh, there could be any number of. Um, Particulars that apply to uh, one company, but not anyone else. So there, 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 there will be a number of information flow right. uh, okay. where this where this role is necessary. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm perfectly fine with this project coordinator. Uh, the, the the other piece, though, um, which we have um, pondered, I guess, is uh, I think there's a role for a project manager or owner's project manager after the awards of the licenses. And that, uh, you know, somebody with construction experience, with familiarity about what was promised um, during mean, this process, who can oversee right. uh, uh, these, these projects on behalf of the, of the commission. Now, whether that uh, uh, individual or firm is part of the initial project coordinator or whether somebody from, say, the building and site design procurement is, is in a better position right. um, to help us on that role, or, or, or both, or, or some other uh, uh, alternative. That's something that we should think about at some point later. <laughs> we have plenty right. of time to do that. Right. But um, I, I, I distinguish that um, uh, helping us look at the design and how it evolves, because it will evolve. Uh, from a schematic to a construction drawing, all of that will be something that we need to have. Right. Okay. But the project manager RFP uh, that uh, Director Day has uh, designed, uh, was overseeing or approving before it goes out, uh, will contemplate the possibility that the project manager brings site design capabilities with him or her and can morph into that position Absolutely. if it's necessary and if it's necessary to do so with the expertise and, and the knowledge gained from participating in the process as it goes along. So, right. so Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, and I have to tune you, Commissioner Stebbins is not here. He is, he is largely responsible for designing that RFR. Right. He's done a great right. job with a lot of a lot of influence. But one of the questions is the Commission did consider in the process, too, the idea of, of the evaluation team's products coming into a separate uh, group and then formulating them into uh, one series of recommendations and, and made a step back uh, and said, no, oh, that's going to, each one of those evaluation team's reports will come in to the Commissioner directly. Uh, so there won't be any interface, and, and a lot of that had to do with Commissioner Zuinga's thoughts too about about making sure it's not a, the product is not uh, a consultant product. Right. Um,
fiscal year budget, and, and our plan is to introduce the information at today's meeting, uh, listen to any discussion, and then fine-tune the proposal during at least the next two weeks, and hopefully we'll be able to present a final proposal uh, for the Commission's consideration week, uh, June 27th meeting. I'd like to defer, if I could, to Treasurer Zuniga, who has actually done the, uh, the great amount of work here to get the proposal budget read, excuse me, proposed budget ready for the Commission's considerations. Great. Thank you. I, um, so uh, as, as part of the packet, there's two um, cash flow projections, a bit of a hybrid of a budget, uh, the results of fiscal year 12, the anticipated results of fiscal year 13, and a cash flow projection of fiscal year 14. Um, I will call your attention to the second page of, of, um, of that tab that has the gaming operations and uh, just briefly walk you through the logic in case you haven't already uh, figured most of it out. Um, fiscal year 12 uh, starts with our initial funding um, and the actual costs in the aggregate um, with a subtotal at the bottom. And the logic progresses the same way to fiscal year 13 with all the um, revenues that we have uh, received on the top part and the costs that we have either incurred, um, accrued, or anticipate to um, ex uh, uh, expend before the end of this fiscal year a couple of weeks from now. Um, and then I'm projecting uh, a budget of uh, fiscal year 14 in the manner as, as, as summarized here. Uh, we could, I could get into any, any assumptions behind any of these numbers if you want me to. Uh, and this budget is projected uh, by month um, for the remaining columns um, in, this, in this sheet. Revenues come in at different uh, uh, times. <coughs> And some expenditures uh, occur at, uh, uh, frankly, every month. Others come in at different times, again, based on what we're contemplating. Um, I have a running tally of a cumulative uh, balance at the bottom, and um, which uh, I put a low point here around April of 2014. Uh, one that is in the positive, which, which is, uh, I believe, good news. Um, and then uh, additional revenues that come in after that once the award of the licenses that keep us in uh, a, a positive cash flow situation. So I can, I can take any questions or I can go into uh, the major assumptions if you, um, if you, if you want me to or uh, I, I, the one thing that I did not um, put in this um, in this sheet is that this is preliminary. This is for discussion purposes. Um, this is not being presented for approval at this point uh, because there are many uh, numbers really behind these uh, assumptions, etc. So I have some. Does anybody else want to jump in? Or? Uh, I had a couple as well. Um, does, uh, we are in the process of hiring uh, both uh, <coughs> consultants um, uh, to help us with the uh, with the uh, evaluations. I mean, with the applications and staff people. We have a number of key staff positions to be filled over the next few months. Do these numbers include both of those? Yes. Let me let me take uh, staff first. Um, these numbers include everybody that we have include uh, 14 uh, full-time equivalencies in addition to what we have right now. Um, of those 14, I would characterize maybe seven are already in the pipeline, CIO, CFO, um, uh, Director of Problem Gambling, uh, and Research, and, and, and others. And um, a Director of Licensing, for example. There's additional FTEs that come right behind them. Uh, because licensing, notably, will have will need staff. There's an additional uh, staff uh, for legal, a couple of administration. In total, uh, uh, 14 full-time equivalencies during the course of 
of the year. And I call it equivalent because not everybody comes in in, in July 1. Uh, so that translates into some ramp up, if you will. Is uh, it, so, there's, um, so you're actually talking about more than 14 people, but they total 14 full-time equivalents when you total them up? That's right. So there's more. Okay, so 14 right. didn't sound like enough people. but nope. so It's many more people, but if you take their salaries together yep. during the course of the fiscal year, That's it's right. 14 full-time. Yep. Okay. It's about 17 or 18 more people. And not 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 many more, but but the point is yes, okay. the four, four, fourteen. And that more or less coordinates with your judgment at the moment about what we'll be adding. At, at this point, <coughs> that's why we, it's a, a preliminary because right. we uh, anticipate uh, working with Commissioner Zuniga and then actually uh, commissioners and working on that staff picture a little bit more because uh, we are trying to project the entire next fiscal year. Yeah. So okay. We've still got we've still got some work to do. But we do have a lot of the areas covered as as. Uh, Enrique stated. Okay, and and then to follow up, are the are the um, the consultants that we hire to help us process the applications? Are they going to be paid for out of our funds, or are there going to be assessments to the applicants the way we assessed um, the investigatory costs? The latter, the latter. They. Um, this is an estimate of, 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 uh, of numbers. It all depends. Uh, the numbers that I've proposed here depend on what we get for advisors and their proposals. I think it's, a, it's an estimate. It's a, in my estimation, it's an esti a good estimate, but I'm the one who made it, so I could be so proven wrong. Good. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, you know, we're assuming that there will be around four firms. Um, um, with uh, or, or uh, three disciplines under the site and building design. It could be one firm or it could be three different ones. A uh, financial advisor, the project coordinator we talked about, and maybe uh, another one for an economic development. Um, and uh, those costs are uh, incurred but then assessed on every applicant proportionately, uh, much like we have done in the, uh, in the phase one investigations. And that's a wash. It's, you can see right. it on the revenue right. on the cost right. side. The right. revenue Six comes in. Right. Yeah, we incur it, and actually we assess it a month later. Uh, so you will you will see the revenues and the costs right. for those two items come in, right. just a little staggered. Right. Uh, but uh, but that's uh, that's fundamentally what um, the dynamic yeah, that's German, a, 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 uh, at play here. Yep. Chairman Cross, I just should note there's we've also um, put in an estimate for the licensing data system as well in there. So that is all. Also built in at this point. Right. That's correct. Others, Commissioner, did you have others? I do not. No. Those were my questions. Um, so you've got, have you, you've allocated out all of the IEB expenses essentially to um, the, the investigations for the period of time of the investigations. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, and and that's being reflected in in the in the we we, uh, we assess that um, a 13.71 percent overhead rate on the investigations. We've gotten a lot of right. those payments already. Uh, there will be a true up, if you will, because right. there was there was an estimate at the time, a projection from our consultants, and in the same venue, uh, I did a projection on our overhead costs. Right. Those will be trued up. Uh, if there's remaining monies, they will be returned. Um, Etc. But all, all of that is being has been um, is contemplated here. Okay. And um, you're going to fill in the uh, commission overhead to racing. It's blank now. Yeah. I uh, yes. Well, here's uh, this is where we go to the first uh, page uh, because they, they do work in, in in tandem. I don't have the uh, the results carry over from fiscal year in racing because any remaining monies in racing go back to purses. Uh, but the current um, fiscal year for racing, as Director Turnberg has projected, um, is, um, will we'll have, we'll have us a little bit in the negative. Um, for, for, for three reasons, I would say, uh, that are new to racing this year. Um, and I have called them out here. Number three, you will see that there's a French on salaries. Um, these the racing, the, 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 the racing commission uh, did not have these costs in the past uh, because the, the Department of Public Licensure picked up those, those fringe costs um, among every other licensing uh, uh, activities that they had. 
uh, but we have them. Um, so that's that's something that's a cost that's essentially new to racing. Uh, there's there's another cost uh, that we're projecting here. Some um, five audits that have to happen uh, uh, that were not being done in the past, and we are contemplating to cost around four hundred thousand uh, during the year. Uh, so with those two costs, uh, we project a slight, uh, a, a small but uh, negative number for the racing operations. And I figured that we, we could still assess uh, an overhead like uh, to racing, but we'd still put it further in the negative. Right. <laughs> um, but it seems to me it's worth accruing a number. I agree. Um, because that, at some point, fine. racing may have the money and could pay the commission back. But I think we, even if it's carried over from year to year, um, who knows what's going to happen, and we might be able to, to be paid back. So I, I think we should have it, right. whatever that number is. Okay. Okay. Um, and is, just before we finish that, is that number then carried over into the second page? Right. It, it would be. Uh, so it's a zero now. Uh, it's number, number four on revenues. Yes. I have number four on revenues. On right. What's revenue. <coughs> commission, revenue. Commission overhead to Dashed raise. out. That's right. Do you see it dashed out? Yeah, but... It's not there, so it's it's a it's a, it's a zero. It's a, if if it's we, a, it, yeah, but on one um, this is me, just a little slow. On one page, it's a negative, and the negative disappears when you go to the second page. Well, it's also a zero in the in the in the one page. It's number it's five funny. on the first page, where it says commission overhead number five. No, I'm I'm sorry. I th we may be talking about different things. But there's a negative number for race. The sub at the bottom. At the bottom, yes. Okay. Yes. And it's that number that I was wondering whether that was carried over into the second. Oh, page. good point. Um, it would be. Uh, not not here yet. So it would put um, um, it would come out of, you know, wherever wherever yeah. Comes that would come out of the come out of the balance. The year the, yes. the year end balance of of fiscal 13 would be reduced by that amount. That's right. Okay. Right. Of fiscal and 14, actually. All right. But they well, the, 13. The, yeah. Well, so 13 or 14, but it shows up here someplace. The, the reason I asked that question is that the April of 2014 number then is lower than the 1.5. That's the I mean, bottom correct. is lower than right. yes. the projected bottom. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, good, good pickup. That's right. Um, it doesn't quite seem possible to me that, in effect, we've only used three million, a little over three million of our um, rainy day fund monies in fiscal 13. Is that right? Well, remember what happens. Uh, what 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 happened with the investigations? Um, we we got all that money. Um, yeah, I know. For uh, for investigations assessments after everybody hit the the low point. And we still have to incur some of that, some of those costs, in the next few months. So, if you we're only looking at fiscal year 13, there was there was an inflow, uh, and not all the outflow has has gone out. Only because we haven't actually uh, paid those uh, all of those bills. We will very soon. Um, some of them, actually, in the in the next fiscal year. Um, oh, okay. okay. So they do. So they do happen. Right. You, you will notice. Um, yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I, I, yeah, I got that. Um, so in your uh, your MGC salaries in fringe, you just average that out. It doesn't grow. You didn't, you, you didn't project the growth by month. You just divided it by twelve. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There will be a ramp up, uh, a slight sort of S curve uh, on that because right. not everybody shows up on July one. Right. Okay. Um, the two, the two uh, numbers that I have highlighted here in green for fiscal year 13 is, um, you know, 5.4 million and 256,000 are um, what I anticipate at this point to be the end result of fiscal year 14 for overall costs of, of the commission. Uh, again, they include actual costs incurred, current encumbrances, you know the rent that we know we're going to have to pay, etc., and then um, our, our projection of additional costs until the end of the fiscal year. Uh, you you may remember that uh, we approved a budget of 6.7 million for fiscal year 13, 
and uh, we're anticipating that uh, we'll be coming under that uh, 5.6 million right. if you add those two uh, those two numbers um, you know most most of it has to do with uh, part of the projections were con uh, conservative uh, on the you know uh, uh, on, on the timing side in terms of uh, some of the people that we um, we knew we were going to hire, uh, I anticipated we were going to hire them slightly earlier, um, and uh, you know some of them have uh, come back a little later. Um, but there's also other uh, numbers that, uh, notably, uh, say outside counsel, I put in a number there uh, that uh, now the, our legal team has uh, has picked up quite a bit. There's been they, they've done a lot of. Uh, of the right writing of the regs, for example, uh, and that has helped us, uh, you know, from a from a financial standpoint. Have you um, if, have we thought about and and is it reflected here in the writing of the phase three, phase three, you know, the next phase of regs? Um, are we assuming a, the use of our consultants at a, at a high level like we have before at an intense level? Uh, no, at a lower level. Uh, but we are okay. We are we are assuming that we could extend uh, our <coughs> our gaming consultants outside of the evaluation. By the way, because they we we need to think about whether right. they they have a role for the evaluation. Uh, that, are consult or that that we will require uh, some general consulting gaming consulting expertise. Uh, and what's going forward? And what is that? Where is that number? How much is that? Um, well, the total for num for consulting work and, and service providers, um, in including the half a million licensing software fee, is one point two million. Uh, one million two forty. And that is, so that's only seven hundred and twenty thousand for what today's for game for today's gaming consultants. Well, well um, for, outside for, no, there's there's outside counsel in there. Um, there's um, yeah okay so that's that's my question yeah that's right it's here it's on this backup yeah um, and I just raised the question whether you know when we're writing the regs for the actual regulation of the buildings you know and the, the it's really detailed stuff a lot of huge detailed stuff and I, I don't really know I don't we haven't spent too much time thinking about how we're going to do it but either we're going to lift it from somebody else and use it as a template and so we don't have to do all that much work or we're going to have to rely tremendously heavily, heavily on our outside consultants. Well, it, we may it, be a little light on that number. It seems to me that it's going to be a, a bit of both. I mean, yeah. in, in a, it, it is, they are tremendously detailed, but they are not uh, unique to Massachusetts. Right. The, so far, we've been dealing with a unique statute and trying to deal with it. So we had no place to go to to, uh, to use uh, find a model, but we got plenty of models around now. So, right. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we're a little light on that number for yeah. that, Mr. Chairman. I think so you're, too. You're okay. Right. Okay. Uh, my dad will also have some additional expertise inside the agency. For instance, the licensing. By that time, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. true. Good point. Um, this is really trivial, but your backup says 15 in, in FTEs, and your um, cover sheet says 14. It doesn't really make any difference. But. I can I can look at that. I was changing some assumptions up until yesterday. Print time. <laughs> we were discussing this right. yesterday with licensing yeah. and IEB. So then you the, are. the only other thing, um, and we talked about this briefly, but on the the backup on the evaluation consultants, 2.3. Yeah. Um, Six and a half million dollars for our evaluation consultants just seems like an incredible huge amount of money. Um, and, it's, and it's mostly in the financial consultants and the building and site design. Do you want to just run through sure. those again? That just seems like a phenomenal amount of money. Yeah. Um, from, uh, from my understanding, at least, again, this, this could be uh, very different based on the responses we get to RFRs. Hopefully, we'll, we'll find out. But um, you'll recall that when we, uh, when we contemplated our so-called um, trip to Wall Street, uh, we, 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 we talked and received uh, three, three RFRs from, um, from uh, investment banking types 
who would be very helpful uh, in this uh, in, in, in that effort. I think uh, we, we, we may have some of those firms hopefully respond as well uh, to, the, to the current RFR. Hopefully others as well. Um, some of them come at a, at a hefty price. Um, they they um, have assumed uh, uh, that uh, it will be an intense period with, with a lot of uh, advisors that, you know, happen to, you know, charge uh, high hourly rates. That could be entirely different from my assumption. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But I'm just, um, that, that would be the, 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 the biggest uh, um, number that I'm really intrigued about what, yeah. what we will get. Um, in, in like in much of our procurements, uh, cost is not uh, a factor, but it is a fact. It is not the only factor, but it is a factor yeah. after everybody has been ascertained to be, you know, the most qualified. Um, so hopefully keeps some of the costs in check, but um, we really we really are after the expertise. Um, then everything else is also depending on how many disciplines we want uh, we want to hire um, or we feel is necessary to hire. Um, if we if there is a firm that can come in with uh, several disciplines, for example, uh, that may my guess is that could be more cost effective. If we for on the on the building and site design, um, if we if we get a couple of individuals say with with expertise in in, in, in three different areas. They would be, uh, again, in my estimation, maybe able to give us a, a, a more more cost-effective rate. Whereas, if we decide that we need three different um, firms, say, for the building and site design, because we want a, a, a traffic expert and an environmental expert and a let's say a, an architectural expert, um, in in my opinion, the, the 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 costs will rise because each firm will have learning curve, we'll have involvement time, um, et cetera. So all of those, uh, depending on how we come out of these uh, solicitations, the costs could vary uh, widely. Now, did we do any checking to see whether a similar process took place at, by other payment commissions? Like, did Ohio do the same kind of thing? Do you know? Did they bring in? Well, or yeah. Pennsylvania? Uh, Pennsylvania does a lot of their decisions in-house. Mm -hmm. um, they've done a lot of, uh, currently, <coughs> the one that they're, um, um, currently bidding uh, in Philadelphia, uh, they we understand that they've done a lot of, they will be doing a lot of that decision in house. Now they've had a lot of rolling Experience. casino decisions, yeah. so um, they are probably in a very good position because they've had a lot of experience and track record with right. that. Um, You'll recall that Ohio, uh, pretty much the operator was chosen by yeah. virtue of the. Um, of the constitutional amendment, so um, the the they did spend a lot of uh, uh, of money on a financial advisor um, that we know by one of those advisors um, right. because um, true, yeah. after they were uh, selected, they they negotiated on behalf of the governor's office yeah. a uh, a better deal for for the state. Right. And we um, know uh, we know we know New York hired uh, an outside investment banker. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, like always, uh, it's it's a mixed it, yeah. it, it's it's a mixed uh, bag, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I we, I think we should just keep you know, think about it when we, when we get these bids in. Think carefully about what we really need. I mean, it's going to be an assessment back on the the on the proposers. So, um, but just be hard nose about it when when we get these proposals in. Now, um, and also, we, or, excuse me, we are. We are checking to see how much help we can get from DOT and EOEA yes. for, for example, the traffic and environmental mm -hmm. stuff and so forth. Yeah. Okay. And those, those um, uh, also all the RFRs pretty are broad enough. Although, just in case this was already mentioned to, to help with um, evaluation or, or monitoring the process as it moves forward as well. So right. I, th I think if, if it might be over in some areas, that may also help out with that process right. as we move forward. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to make that point that right. uh, we, we have a mix. We have advisors from other agencies. We'll have staff. We'll have commissioners, and we'll have um, advisors, paid advisors, right, as well. And these are really unique uh, 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 
ex uh, uh, pockets of expertise that we're not going to need on a long range basis. Mm -hmm. So that so oh, that yeah. we, we, it doesn't make any sense to we don't have the staff. And we, and That's a very good point. To have it. Perhaps compared to Pennsylvania, where right. they have a number of these, right, right. it makes sense to bring right. people in and staff up. Right. Uh, we have a an intense period of award, and then we move into monitoring and oversight. Right. So we uh, we probably need those advisors. Okay, great, Mr. Chairman. That that uh, that brings me to a task we're very excited about, and I'd like to introduce Mark Vanderlinden, uh, who's sitting next to me. And I know all of you have had the chance to say hello to him. Uh, Mark will join the staff. Uh, late this month as Director of Research and Problem Gambling. Uh, there's a, a number or a, quite a bit of information about Mark behind tab 3B if you haven't already seen it. I'd like to take a minute just to comment on a, a couple things in there uh, for the benefit of the audience and the public. Uh, Mark is most recently the Executive Officer of the Office of Problem Gambling uh, Treatment and Prevention uh, at the Iowa Department of Public Health. Uh, he is also currently the board president at the Association of Problem Gambling Service Administrators and on the board of directors uh, for the National Center for Responsible Gambling. I might add that, at least as uh, last I knew, our agreement is that Mark will continue in these roles as he moves forward in this year and with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Uh, in addition, uh, Mark, uh, in his role in Iowa, uh, directs all aspects of problem gambling services for the state, including treatment, prevention, marketing, research, and training. And so with those comments, I'd like to turn it over to Mark. And Let me, and, let me uh, interrupt before. Sure. I don't want to leave in the middle of Mark's comments, um, and I'm going to have to leave, but so I'm going to just put in my own two right. cents worth here. First of all, first of all, for the record, uh, the commission has delegated the ability to hire and fire uh, all personnel, including senior personnel like directors, uh, to Director Day. Uh, we do are interested in meeting these folks, uh, and sometimes Director Day will ask for our advice and, and participation in the role, but um, the hire has been made, so this is not to interview, this is simply to meet. But just I just wanted to say my own thoughts. You know, I, I, I got to know Mark a little bit at a couple of confer at a conference, heard a lot about him, um, and uh, it was pretty clear to me that this was the best person in the country to get for this position. People in the jurisdiction, in, in this business across the country, uh, Mark was the most distinguished can candidate out there. Um, but I think it should not go unsaid that if it were not for the help of one Marlene Warner, <laughs> the uh, director, executive director of the Mass Council on Compulsive Gaming, we may not have been able to reel Mark in. So I would like to have a shout out to Marlene for thank you for your help. Um, Mark had to move uh, family and two little kids from Iowa, and it was a big deal. But um, speaking for myself, we're absolutely thrilled. You know, it's great to have you here. Um, I respect tremendously what you've done, and uh, I'm sorry I'm going to miss you talking about it. But I'm looking forward to what you will do with this opportunity. Um, so thank you to you and to Susie and your kids for making the move and to Marloon for helping out. I'm going to excuse myself. Commissioner McHugh, do you want to take over and you want to sit here and run this meeting? Uh, sure. Yeah. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Chairman. We still have a quorum, so. So Mark, uh, uh, I too uh, join in welcoming you and, and would welcome hearing uh, what you have to say and then, and then uh, I know everybody wants to express their pleasure at your being here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to join the commission and uh, thank um, Mr. Day, the commissioners, for just a, a thoughtful process um, and, and kind of talking about what the, the role of the commission is. Um, I've learned a lot about, about what the commission does um, and about expanded gambling, gambling in Massachusetts along the way. Um, you know, speaking about, okay, so what, what is to be done? Um, there, is a, there is a lot to be done in the, in the state of Massachusetts. And um, one of the things that stuck out for me through the interview process is, is really about what can we do and, and how can we do it right the, the first time. Um, and I think that that's what's resonated for me um, through this whole process, that, that there is a great opportunity here to, to really um, to take a look at the state of Massachusetts and and how can we make a difference 
um, in terms of helping problem gamblers, in terms of mitigating any uh, mitigating the potential harm along the way, about promoting responsible gambling as as we look at an era where gambling is expanding. Um, I think that taking the research um, that that has been launched so far, looking at how do we translate that into the very best possible practice that we can do um, over the next, you know, over the lifetime of this. Um, continuously evaluating how can we do this better? Um, how can we, um, you know, how can we make the smallest amount of problem gamblers there are um, and then provide effective treatment <coughs> for them? <clears throat> um, this is thrilling because as, as I look at the, uh, the work that we've done in Iowa, as I look at work that's being done uh, across the country, this is, this is, um, this is some of the, the, the most progressive work that, that I've seen. And it's, it's just an honor to be able to, to join this team and, and be a part of that. Well, we're delighted to have you. Uh, commissioners? Uh, no, I, I first had uh, the opportunity, Mark came on the radar screen when we had one of our forums out in Lynn. And Mark was there and certainly an impressive speaker. So we all knew the name. We all heard your, um, your expertise and your passion about the subject matter. And um, so again, I, I, I uh, reiterate that we're thrilled to have you. And we all look at this as an opportunity to do the best we can with this issue. And, uh, and having you on board will help us do the very best job. Same thing, just joining uh, the, 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 the thrill in, uh, uh, that, that you're here with us. Um, I'll, I'll just speak a little bit about, uh, from, from my perspective, my learning curve and all this, um, just to join, to join this conversation. Um, as, as, as many in this room uh, uh, know, we, we started with this research procurement. Uh, there's this big mandate in the legislation, which you alluded to, uh, progressive mandate and funding. Um, which is very important, that comes to the area of, you know, protecting pro uh, problem gamblers. And um, I personally learned a lot through um, the procurement that we conducted and, and the approach and the nuances in terms of the, method the methodology and, 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 and what's being done in other jurisdictions, notably around the world. Um, and. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's also very, uh, it's very exciting, it's very, uh, it's very progressive, as you say, but it's also very challenging, which is um, uh, when, we, when we quickly realize we need, we need somebody who, who can help us do this, uh, somebody who knows the field and has been in the forefront of, of, all, these, of all these issues. And I think we, we found um, in you somebody who will really help us with that because you are nationally, and I would post internationally recognized in this area. Uh, so, um, thank you for, for being here. I add my thanks, too. I, I um, think this is an enormously important role uh, for us. Um, and uh, recently, I um, sort of had a shape-shifting moment um, when I heard somebody talk about the problem gambling uh, issue in terms of the interaction between the gambler and the environment and uh, both pieces of which uh, can contribute to the problem. And uh, we are now about to begin uh, the process of writing the game rules and the other rules that will drive us forward with the operations of, of the casinos once they're, uh, and slots parlors once they're built and up and running. Uh, and it seems to me that we need uh, uh, your energy and vision and help uh, to think about that interaction and both pieces of the problem as we begin to write these rules. Uh, and I think that is an enormously challenging and fascinating um, undertaking for the Commission. So I, I think your, your arrival is timely and I, I really look forward to working with you and to benefiting from your expertise and insights as we, as we approach that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, significant task. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, I think you're off the hot seat for the minute. But, uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 one more, one, one final question. When is it that you, you begin uh, uh, working here full time? You're still in a transitional I'm, state. Yeah. Yes, I'm still in transition. Um, 
we're, we're here for just a few days, fly back to Iowa, and next week we'll, we will be moving out to Massachusetts with an anticipated start date or a start date of um, the 26th. Great. Able That's to great. find housing? And we, we have found didn't housing. Didn't have sticker shock? We, we, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's right. the normal response. <laughs> well, I, I was wondering how Mark could answer that. <laughs> well, you could not be otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I think as well, we should, the, uh, um, my travels around the country and, and the commission's uh, commitment to problem gambling research is evident as well by, I think, the level that, uh, uh, Mark selection, but also the level he is in the organization, because that that isn't necessarily the way it is with various uh, gaming commissions and gaming control agencies around the country. So it, I think it is unique and, and sends a good uh, message uh, regarding problem gambling and reflects well on the commission. Great. So thank you, Mark. Thank we, look, you. We'll, we will see you at the end of the month. Great. Good. Good. Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Commissioner McHugh, I have um, uh, really brings me to the end of my administrative report, uh, and unless the question has other questions for me, it brings us to the legal report, as I understand our ombudsman uh, has, does not uh, have a report uh, today for the commission, unless you have questions of him. Uh, does any, well, let's, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Director Day. Uh, does anybody have, then, any questions for um, our ombudsman? All right. Thank you. Uh, then let's move on to the legal report. Mr. Grossman, good Ms. Morning. Blue, good morning. I need the microphone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. We have two items before you today. We have the revised steps to licensing that is here simply for your review. We made the changes in the, to the documents that you had requested from our last review. And then we also have for you today the final version, hopefully, of the RFA2 application. We have incorporated changes that, that we've discussed. We've um, run it by consultants and incorporated their comments. And so Mr. Grossman has a few areas he'd like to point out to you, but then would take questions on any of the questions or sections that you have. All right. Are you going to begin with the uh, steps um, piece, or is that, uh, insofar as you're concerned, a done deal? I believe that's done, unless there are any particular questions on it. All right. Does anybody have any questions about the, about the steps? All right, I had one and uh, with respect to item 32, and it's item 32 in all of them, the class one, class two, and region, category one, category two, and region C. Um, could you just explain, I'm, I'm sure I'm supposed to know that this, but could you just explain what 32 represents? Uh, sure, uh, that I believe, and I, I I don't have the benefit of the master schedule in front of me, but I believe that's the date by which um, all of, if the uh, arbitration process kicks in for the surrounding communities or the uh, impacted live entertainment venues, that would be the latest date by which uh, all of those agreements would have to be submitted. So. It could be much sooner. That, I think, reflects probably 80 days from the day that <coughs> the applications are due or thereabouts. Okay, so that would be the end of the arbitration period if arbitration were necessary. That's right. Okay. Um, then we could we would, we would not, until that date, be able to commence uh, the hearing process, and the hearing would have to commence no earlier than 30 days after that, right? Well, I, I think you could commence the hearing process sooner. Right. Um, the public hearing. Yeah. The public hearing. It's, right. You can't commence the hearing process until the designations of the surrounding communities and the venues have been made. That doesn't, it doesn't mean that they have to have executed agreements. All right. 
Okay. But won't the arbitra arbitration process possibly designate a surrounding community? No, no. you will designate we'll the surrounding designate. communities. Right. They right. will then have to go and negotiate an agreement. Now, certainly okay. in a perfect world, perhaps, you wouldn't commence the public hearings until the agreements have been fully executed. Right. Uh, but that would push, in theory, everything back up to almost three months. Significantly, yeah. Yes, that's right. That yeah. was, uh, yeah, that was my, that was the, where I was headed. Um, all right, so let's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, uh, I'll take that uh, answer. Um, do these dates that are in these um, um, step uh, outlines correspond with the number of days that are on that other chart that I don't have uh, in front of me now, the, but the, the we've discussed chart. the previous uh, motion. Yes, it, they do. They reflect the most recent discussion that we had and the most recent version that we okay. looked at. So yes. the 100 days basically for processing the Category 1s and the 74, 75 days for processing the Category 2s. That's correct. Are reflected in these. Yes. Okay. All right. Commissioner McHugh, I might just add that we'll, we'll, I think it would be helpful just to go ahead and recheck your dates against those um, process sheets right. with, the, with the evaluation process right. to make sure that they right. match. Right. Because these would be helpful things to have up on the, on the, um, on the <coughs> web so everybody could see them. And um, uh, that uh, 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 integration would be, would be helpful before we do that. Okay. Any other questions uh, on those? Okay. Then you can, if you want to, uh, Mr. Grossman, you can proceed to the to the uh, application. Let me say that uh, as you do that, uh, that uh, uh, having looked at this uh, carefully uh, and having watched it develop, I think this is really a, a fascinating and creative way of handling this process. It has a number of attributes that I think um, will benefit every participant and stakeholder in this process, including members of the public. It has, um, first of all, uh, uh, the capability of being easily filled out electronically. It's extensive and it's long, but the evaluation criteria uh, uh, hinted at that and suggested that. Uh, but it has the ability to be filled out um, uh, electronically. Uh, it has the ability to segregate uh, the sensitive from the non-sensitive material and to allow immediately uh, a large chunk of this uh, and, the, and, and a summary answer, at least, of, of every question uh, to be uh, distributed to the public uh, rapidly after the application is filed. And it has a mechanism for easily identifying the um, uh, components that are presumptively confidential so that they can be stripped away as the rest is revealed. And that was the latest addition that you made uh, since we last looked at a draft. So I think this is, a, this is an excellent um, approach to a very difficult and complicated task. Um, you can, you can uh, I'll, thank you, pick up on that. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll pick up there, uh, sure. And uh, I, I would just note that to get to this point, uh, it's been a, a, the result of a collaborative process uh, amongst uh, many, including the commissioners individually and the staff, including our uh, consultants who have uh, added in a number of uh, key comments that have uh, led us to adjust some of these questions. And those are, there are some of those uh, comments that I'd like to just bring your attention to. And then I'd also just like to flag quickly uh, a couple elements of this application just to ensure that everyone is clear as to why we've included uh, certain parts. Um, uh, the first thing, as was uh, astutely observed by uh, General Counsel Blue, on page 9, we need to just adjust the uh, the uh, application deadline dates. They're backwards uh, for Category 2 and Category 1. But we also just wanted to confirm, in fact, that these are the dates um, and that we also discussed uh, offline adding in a 2 p.m. Uh, deadline for these on these dates. 2 p.m. If there's no yeah. objection, only because it's going to be New Year's Eve and we thought that perhaps oh, we should. Oh, uh, interesting. Right, so I'm ready to go home early. I thought you were trying right. to avoid that 5 o'clock rush we had with right. the first Well, that's one. another good reason. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a good reason, yeah. And I think it's October 4th, not the 3rd. And uh, whether it's October 3rd or 4th, but uh, <laughs> we'll make it October 4th. It's, I think it's a 
there's there. It's not. There's no magic to those dates. Okay. Good. Okay. So as uh, we don't uh, necessarily need to go through it unless there are questions, but of course we've uh, all the uh, changes we've made we've highlighted to yeah. draw your attention to them. Uh, happy to take any questions on any of the language we've included. Uh, I had a question on page 18. If you if you hadn't or something you wanted to highlight before that. Uh, no, we can certainly. Go and, and that is in in the middle of the page of uh, stricken out uh, inclusion of a redacted. Uh, electronic copy um, of the form of the application. Uh, are we going to get a redacted electronic copy, or, or what, what, what was the underlying reason for that? Well, I, I think th this is, is probably the biggest part of the discussion that we need to have is the public records. I know that it's been the biggest uh, addition since the last time you've seen this, and this. Uh, it, it goes back to uh, page 16, which talks about public records. And then, as you'll observe, at the very end of the application, we've added uh, an entire public records section. Um, one of the things that I just highlight as we go into this and that we can uh, show up here is that we've added hyperlinks into the application itself so uh, users can bounce around uh, easily within the document itself. Uh, apparently, it's not in this page, so that didn't work. Because that's a scanned document. Well, oh, you can see that the, the links are all highlighted yep. in blue. Right. Uh, right. Some of them are to external uh, sources, others are to links within the document itself. But in any event, there is at the very end of the application uh, section C. So, uh, Commissioner McHugh, the uh, plan that we have come up with is one that, as, as you described, uh, uh, is intended to ensure uh, a number of things. Uh, first and foremost is that we comply with the public records law, which of course includes the additional uh, exemption built in by the legislature into the Expanded Gaming Act uh, for trade secrets and other sorts of uh, proprietary information that would uh, uh, lead to uh, uh, problems if they were released. So what we have come up with in order to ensure that we can release the application and the public records uh, piece of it quickly is set up a system whereby, as, as you described, the application itself, the form, uh, and it will be less than the 300 plus pages it is now since there's a lot of uh, editing and, and other, so it'll be far less than 315. Uh, we're hoping to get it down to 305 or so. Um, <laughs> that's that's a great relief to all the uh, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> no it'll be it'll be uh, far less than that but in any event uh, we'll be able to release the application form itself and one of the key uh, elements to being able to do that is that we have included as we've discussed in the past boxes in many uh, on many of the question pages in which we are requesting or uh, requiring the applicants to include an overview of their response to the question which they will attach. And the overview will provide critical pieces of information that we don't believe are exempt from uh, uh, disclosure under the public records law, uh, by which we will be able to give the public and, and others um, uh, an explanation as to what the uh, applicant's plans are. Uh, relative to each of these uh, subject areas. So the first part of the plan is to be able to release this document in its entirety. So applicants should certainly be aware of that. So the second part of it then is to uh, highlight for the applicants and the public uh, which pieces of information within the uh, application that the Commission believes will implicate an exemption to the public records law. And though there are, I, I believe, 20, I went back and, and counted them, I think there are, are 20 exemptions to the public records law, one of them being the statutory exemption. And what that means is that if there's some statute that allows uh, exemption of public records, then you can assert that. And in our case, uh, there is a, a statute that calls for the exemption of uh, records specific to gaming applications. And by and large, after a uh, review of the entire application, it appears to us as though that will be the exemption that will primarily be asserted 
uh, for most of the documents that we believe to be exempt from the public records law. And what we mean by that is that unlike with the RSA 1 process, there won't be a tremendous amount of personal information that will have to be redacted. There may not be a tremendous amount of information, if any, that would fit under the investigatory exemption, whereby we wouldn't release something because it will compromise our investigation. Uh, and there aren't a number of, uh, of many other exemptions that would be implicated here. By and large, there are two exemptions, and we, we've cited both of those at the end. There's the statutory exemption, and then there's, the, uh, there's an exemption for blueprints and uh, security and other uh, types of information that we've noted uh, in the back as well. So the, the, the plan is then to uh, have the commission identify the areas within the application, uh, the response to which will uh, presumptively include information that would be exempt from disclosure. And what we have done, and this is an area that the, the, we'd ask the Commission to take a look at, is in the uh, very end, Section C, so it's the last four pages or so, uh, we've included the whole public record section. And as you'll see, it starts on page 313, it's, and it's up on the screen here as well. We have identified, and there, there's one more question that I, 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 I noticed we had to add in, uh, but uh, we've identified every question that we believe will uh, necessarily contain attachments or uh, information that are exempt from disclosure. And we afford the applicant the opportunity to take advantage of that, if you will, uh, by doing two things. First of all, they would, if they agree with our assessment that the materials submitted uh, in accordance or in response to these particular questions are exempt under the uh, language of the statute that we've laid out, then they would check the yes box here, uh, meaning that they are requesting that we assert that exemption. And the second thing they would have to do is in the electronic filing where they attach the individual documents uh, to whether it's the CD or, or other uh, medium or whether they uh, upload it onto our server, that when they label the document that it contain the word confidential in it. So we will be able to easily uh, identify those documents that the applicant believes uh, meet uh, the exemptions that we've identified. So we, we've built in a basically a check and a balance here. Uh, so the applicant flags the particular document, confidential, and then checks the box here. Uh, if the applicant either does, doesn't agree that an exemption applies or does not uh, oppose, uh, i.e. assents to the release of certain documents, they can also flag that uh, in section C here by checking the no box and identifying those documents, and or not including the word confidential in the electronic uh, labeling of the document. So what that will do is uh, it, it, will, it will further our goal of being able to release uh, information to the public as quickly as possible uh, and ensure that we release as much of it as we, we uh, responsibly can. So the second phase of that would be for us to go through uh, this section uh, in, in conjunction with the electronic filing, pluck out any documents that don't have the confidential, the word confidential in the electronic labeling, uh, compare that against this chart, and those documents would presumptively, we'll obviously look at them, but they presumptively be public records. Um, the third part of the process. So right there, we've released a tremendous amount of, of information. Um, and the third part of that will be under our regulations to allow uh, applicants to request confidential treatment of any other documents they believe to be sensitive. Uh, and we believe that this um, is the most efficient way to uh, handle this issue under the law. Um, it, it, it covers all of our goals. It's, it's in accordance uh, with the law, and uh, it should satisfactorily protect 
any information that, that shouldn't be disclosed while ensuring that the public has access to any documents uh, that they're uh, entitled to and would be interested in seeing. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the uh, system that we've proposed. To, to get back to your question, why did we uh, remove any uh, uh, mention of the word redaction? We obviously had some difficulties the first time around uh, by asking applicants to redact documents. So in this case, in the system we have proposed, there, we're not asking the applicants to redact any documents. What we are asking is just in the, the narrow uh, third category of documents, the, the situation in which the applicant believes that documents that we have not identified as being uh, exempt from uh, disclosure are, are indeed uh, meeting some pr uh, exemption somehow. They would just flag that document and we would then have to go look through those documents and we could redact those documents ourselves uh, the way we see fit. It seems like it would be a uh, more efficient process than having to go through uh, uh, any redactions that have already been made by the applicants. Um, I, I suppose you could argue that both ways, and you know, why don't we ask them to do it? And uh, but that that was just the the uh, the, the plan we came up with. Um, the the hope is, of course, is that that third category, the documents that the applicant ha is is going to seek uh, protection for, will be relatively small in nature and manageable for us. We obviously have somewhat uh, limited uh, staff and resources that who can go through this. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that uh, everyone's going to be reviewing the uh, applications as well. So we'll have to, we, we do need some system to be able to timely deal with these public records uh, inquiries as well. Um, and it, it seemed to us as though that that was the best way to do it. So we did scrub the application for any reference to redactions and things like that. We, we're not asking for redacted uh, records anywhere. Thank you. I just... From my recollection, and, uh, uh, this is kind of in the lessons, if I recall correctly, this is in the lessons learned process mm -hmm. because uh, they're, uh, although it sounded good getting the redacted uh, application along with the uh, it's a complete application, really served to be a duplication and cause staff to have to go all the way back to read those forms anyway. And uh, uh, so I think the process is to try to find a, a little better way to accomplish that goal. So the, the idea, if I, if I get to, uh, to the bottom line, uh, is that uh, uh, from the commission's standpoint and from the applicant's standpoint, a, a document would uh, be either a public document or a non-public document, and partially public would not be at least the norm that we would anticipate. Right. That That's the issue. Right. right. And, and uh, uh, the questions that have been designed lend themselves to that because each of the questions is narrow and pointed and focused so that I take it that's part of what you took into account that that they either or uh, as opposed to partial uh, approach will work that's right yeah. and you know there's a practical element to right. all of this as well right uh, for us to sit and go through every document for nine or ten applications whatever it is just won't work. It, it'll take us two years to go through every right. document and try to redact mm -hmm. every single right. document. Right. <coughs> okay, that's very helpful, and that's, that's a thoughtful approach to a, a, a difficult problem. The uh, check sheet, a uh, checkoff sheet at the end, I think, is uh, particularly helpful for mm -hmm. both the applicants and members of the public, and for the processing of them. That's a, it's a great way to do the pro forma piece uh, to show where we think things are confidential. And we've tried to make clear our plans in, in a number of different areas, so it may seem repetitive at times, but right. we wanted everyone to right. understand. Uh, and another uh, key component here uh, that we've discussed is in the pre-application uh, pre consultation, if you will, that the regulations provide for with the commission or staff. Uh, that would be something I think we would uh, suggest the commission uh, recommend, not just not just kind of have out there for people to take advantage of, but we recommend uh, that applicants 
uh, come in to meet with the executive director and other staff to just go through the application on an individual basis to ensure a clear understanding as to the uh, commission's expectations and how it envisions the public records element uh, working and specifically what type of information should be included in the boxes and how the you know all the documents should be labeled things like that uh, to ensure that at the end we don't have uh, any similar issues so it is it is a, a resource that is included in the regulations and one that I think we would uh, encourage applicants to take advantage of. Do we have some kind of a process for applicants to uh, request that or can we create a process that we could post on the web so that so that people could understand how to how to make a request for appointments and, and the like, and we could give them? Uh, well, I, I can discuss that with uh, Mr. Day after. Uh, we just kind of flagged it in red here uh, as a placeholder in the application. It's on page five, uh, how we want to do it. And we can uh, come up with a, a system for that. We can well, pull it out, too, and put it on the page, too, yeah. application page, specifically. Yeah, I'm thinking. Right, I'm thinking particularly of the encouragement piece, yeah. uh, reaching out to people mm -hmm. and, and rather than waiting for them to discover this in right. here as they pick up the application and right. decide really it'll take more reading Encourage than they have time them. for. Right. Or we could have mandatory training. Right, <laughs> right. Can I, can I go back to uh, the public records um, section in the end? Um, which I think is, is, is great, as Commissioner McHugh was, was uh, agreeing with this. Um, uh, but I am thinking it's all, it's all a matter of the level of detail that could be contained in some of these documents. Um, I could pick uh, a couple of these, you know, the revenues, say, for uh, the projected revenues to the Commonwealth uh, or, or a few others where it would be in, in everybody's interest that that is eventually, perhaps not right up front, but eventually a public record. Um, and we're talking maybe necessarily as to the level of detail. I know we will have a summary in each one of those questions, um, but I, I wonder if, if there's a timing uh, sunset here um, that we should consider, uh, meaning that, uh, assume that, that, that initially something is protected um, because of the level of detail that it contains. But is there a time to consider it's no longer protected because reasons have changed? It's no and longer competitively sensitive. Correct. Or, no longer. Or, or licenses are awarded. No longer competitively sensitive. Yeah. Well, well said. I think that possibility certainly exists for a number of documents. One of the difficulties we had is that we don't know exactly which what documents Precisely. are going to be included. So we couldn't go through each document and say, this one's in, that, that one's out. We just had to go through the questions. Um, and so, you know, something like that, I, I think, is, is a very real possibility at the end of the process. Or even at the public hearing stage. Um, should, should, we, should we put something in here? That's, a, 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 that's an important and interesting point. Should we put something in here to alert people to that possibility, <laughs> along with perhaps a um, uh, uh, statement that we won't, uh, uh, if we mark it uh, presumptively private, we, we may release it, but, but only after consulta further consultation with them so that people will get a heads up and an opportunity to be heard on that. Uh, it may be that at a public hearing, it, by the time we get to that stage, it would be important to have that released so we could talk about it, ask questions about it. Um, and then after the license has been awarded, it seems to me a lot of things change. And, uh, not everything necessarily, but, but a lot of things may change. Right, internal controls, surveillance right. will right. remain, right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but others, right. other ones. Mm -hmm. So if we said something to that, then everybody would be on notice, and, and uh, we, would, we would, of course, uh, talk to them about it and give them an opportunity to be heard before we changed. Okay, we can, we can add that. We can do that. Any other questions or yeah. thoughts? Oh, I think. Uh, I had one question, which was, there's a lot of, um, you, Todd, you have a lot of question marks here. 
were you looking for us to agree with a deletion, for example? Um, you, you, you highlighted it with a question mark, and a lot of it had to do with deleting the question. Right. Uh, Is that what you were looking for, was us to say yes, go ahead and delete, or? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, can, we can go about it any number of different ways. I would suggest that most of the ones that I've raised a question with, mm -hmm. that I am suggesting to you that it is duplicative yes. or that it should be deleted. Yes. So if you, it, with a few exceptions that I flagged that we can go back through, I, we've actually changed our course on one or two. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if, if there's, if there's any disagreement, then we can change it. A, a lot of them had to do with consolidating questions mm -hmm. and merging questions that appeared to be asking the same for the same information. So it's not as though we were removing a question altogether. No, that's we, very clear in um, what you did. So um, I'd suggest that, you know, if you have a specific question on a question, we could discuss it. Otherwise, I would basically just be recommending that we remove any question or, or do whatever I, I've raised the question about. Uh, and th there were some, though, that I actually had questions about. So why don't we go we, through we those that you have questions about, and let's deal with, okay. deal with those, and then we'll, we'll sum up at the end. Uh, um, what to do with the rest. Okay. My 20 tabs here, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, page 28. Go ahead. Uh, we use the term outward looking. Now, I think anyone who's followed this process understands what the commission means by outward looking. Uh, but a question was raised as to whether that is a commonly uh, understood term or whether we should add some clarification as to what the commission means by an outward looking physical structure. Uh, um, I'm thinking of, um, you know, integration with the community. Uh, maybe, maybe a term that may be better suited here. Um, rather than trying to be dictatory as to whether it's outward or, or inward looking. It just came to mind. So that, uh, so we'd, we'd substitute something that, that uh, talks about that concept rather than outward looking. A concept rather, better. yeah, a standard uh, right. rather, rather than, you know, uh, a physical attribute. Is that helpful? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we just replaced that sentence with are, something. Are we always looking for integration? Well, the Isn't that a matter of? Well, there, there, there is, uh, you know, language that, that I, I'm not, not going to be able to find right now, but there is there's integration with the host and surrounding community, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the statute. Uh, and, and, you know, one, one could argue that outward looking may be one form, but it's not exclusively the only way to integrate with the community. Mm -hmm. um, so if we if we talk less in terms of a physical attribute and more as a, in a concept, mm -hmm. we may be better positioned. And the respondent can always say that I don't <coughs> plan to do that for some reason. Uh, and well, that's the, the point I was yeah. making. Oh, I think right. that there may be strategies that say that the better project stands out and doesn't necessarily right. integrate. Right, mm -hmm. right. But they wouldn't be prohibited from answering this that way. We don't propose to do it. But by phrasing the question that way, doesn't that give meaning to the fact that that's what we're looking for? I, th uh, I suppose it does, yeah. yeah. But we are, well, that's part of our criteria, I think. Some, some, some relationship to the criteria, and that goes back to the AIA presentation that we had about not having a, a um, hypothetically, a Wild West building in the middle of East Boston, right? Uh, correct, but um, is that what the exact language says, integration? Uh, we can come back to this, to this idea. Mm. I, 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 I know it's in the white paper from the AIA, but I, mm. I, um, I seem to recall this also language in the legislation that would suggest that. 
So the, co the concept is how do you propose to have the, the casino relate to the surrounding community? Maybe that's mm -hmm. the best way to do it and, and let people <coughs> take away the integration concept. How do, mm -hmm. how do you propose the casino will relate to uh, the surrounding communities and I like that what do you hope to mm -hmm. achieve by that relationship? Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. Could, that, I suggest, uh, could, you, could I suggest just host community or host and surrounding yeah. community? Right. Surrounding community has a right. particular oh. connotation. Right. Right. Would that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. I like that language. Okay. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, next is page 46. On this particular question, the chair actually uh, uh, presented some alternative language. We just wanted to make sure that the, the commission is agreeable. Uh, if so, we can uh, just use the highlighted section. What's a sensitivity analysis? Scenarios, different scenarios. Uh, is that a commonly yeah. accepted term that yeah. people will understand? Well, we could uh, make it more explicit, you know, of, of, uh, an optimistic, a pessimistic, best case, worst case, we could try to frame it or we could leave it open. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily know sensitivity analysis. It doesn't jump out as me as something that is easy to understand what we're looking for. Suppose um, we just said describe the plans on a best, worst, and average case scenario. Uh, describing a best, worst, and average case scenario, the applicant's planning capacity for accommodating. Yeah, we could. We could. Um, a sensitivity analysis, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, a sophisticated sensitivity analysis, in my view, could get to what is the vacancy rate, the highest vacancy rate, say, that I could withstand before... So that is a name. term you're familiar with, and you've uh, seen it in other... Yeah, they, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's an art term, term of art, rather, mm -hmm. sometimes, but, but I think it's understood. Uh, we could make it more explicit, or just what Commissioner McHugh said. We could, we could frame it in a best-case, worst-case. Why don't we do that? And if somebody wants to give us a, 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 something that is a, a more traditional sensitivity analysis, right. they can do that. You know, this, um, this brings me to a point that I think... Um, you know, cuts across a couple of others. Um, when we get our advisors, uh, they, they could, you know, the, 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 I'm thinking of financial advisor, um, you know, they could easily um, have a, just a term description on, on a couple of other of, of questions like this. So, right. Um, I was uh, uh, thinking that at least some of these questions may at some point be fine-tuned, not just after these, but cer certainly after, after today. But the application, the plan is to release the application tomorrow or yeah. Monday. Right, yes. Tomorrow or Monday. So and this is really yeah. mm -hmm. no the time. time. We can always request further information, yeah. uh, clarification, yeah. and the like. But this application is about to be published. Yeah. Okay. So this is our last crack at it. Fair enough. Yeah. Then we could leave it generic. Sure. <coughs> Submit an analysis. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's a simple that's way good. of doing it. That's mm -hmm. great. Okay. Okay. Page 56. This deals with the bankruptcy. Uh, it's been suggested that uh, we've, we already have this information as it relates to the RFA 1 process and that uh, it is duplicative. Uh, to include it here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's any uh, separate uh, use for it in this application. So if we already have it, I don't know why we need to ask for it again. Um, do we, we do have a question in here that asks for updates so that anything of this sort that happened since January 15 right. would be updated when the RFA 2 is filed, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so I'm not sure we need it here. That's fine. Right. Yeah, I think we can remove. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and the next page, page 57, mm -hmm. uh, a number of people have uh, uh, 
uh, flag this question. And uh, I thought it would be helpful just to take a look at it and make sure we're asking the right question in the right way. Um, it, it's been suggested perhaps that if this isn't exactly the way we intended it, that we, we just ask for a description of any minority sources of financing. Uh, and doing it that way would uh, would mean that the, the applicant wouldn't have to go to each of its sources and ask for a, a racial and gender and ethnic breakdown. They could just answer the mm -hmm. question. Uh, sounds sounds fair. Know. Unless that's a critical piece of information, and we want them to go ask all of the uh, lenders and others. I thought it was odd when I read this <coughs> the first time. I didn't. I don't think that's readily available information. Um. Yeah, I, th I, I, th I think the way you, you frame it maybe as, as to what we're trying to get at. I know this was a question of the chair. Mm -hmm. um, just just ask it openly and see. Yeah, let's, let's mm -hmm. ask it openly okay. uh, in, a more, mm -hmm. in a broader fashion. Uh, page 65, I, I would just note that we've beefed up. I don't have any particular comment on this. Uh, this is just the internal control section. Uh, uh, we, we have gotten a number of comments on this um, in that we don't yet have regulations governing internal controls. So we're mm -hmm. basically just asking uh, each applicant what standards they basically they anticipate using subject to mm -hmm. uh, any forthcoming regulations. Right. No, that'll be helpful. In mm -hmm. Perhaps helping us focus on regs. Uh, page 80. This is one that I had originally stricken that I think we actually want to keep in after further review. It, it does ask a separate question. We're asking for this is these are items that wouldn't be included in uh, the uh, capital investment right. calculation, but that you'd probably want to know about. Right. So we should actually leave that in. Right. Okay. Uh, while we're here on page 81, I would just point out, because this point was raised as well, uh, you'll observe that we've, and everyone uh, can observe, this is how we have flagged uh, the distinction between uh, questions that everyone has to answer and, and ones that um, only category of one applicants have to answer and perhaps category two applicants don't have to answer. So that, those, that we've done that for a number of questions like that. Yeah, that was an issue that was raised in, uh, uh, early on, and now we've, we've made clear, which applies to Category 1 only. Okay. Uh, page 131. Todd, could, could we go back to page 67? Is that um, highlighted as duplicative, another one? Yes. So this question we actually ask elsewhere. That's on page 237. <coughs> yes. So I think we asked mm -hmm. the same question twice, basically. And um, it would probably be best in, uh, I think, where it is here in Section 2. Security. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not the building and site design section. So we could delete the one on page 237. There was a lot more language or a lot more um, narrative in the earlier version, though, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So that was deleted for a reason? The second one? Well, less language in the second one for a reason. Uh, I'm not sure why there, there was less language there exactly. It may have just slipped into two parts of the, uh, I assume it's in the matrix two places and yeah it may have just been an oversight okay but it's due 
Executive, do you have a preference for one or the well, other commission? Yeah, I, I kind of like the um, additional language. I think you're asking about intent and commitment. So if it's one or the other, you could pick the longer one. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we would keep the one on page 67. But move it to security. Oh, you'd prefer to have it. Well, in the I, I'm the. Well, so you're talking about leaving the one um, under revenue rather than security, is that right? Where would you like to see it? Uh, I don't okay. know. It seemed to make sense in security to me, but I like the language from... Okay, we can move, we can move. Uh, we'll move 224 to... Uh, which page was that? I lost it that is page. about two, security two and accountability and integrity. Yeah. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So the longer version will be the one we use, but we'll move it to the security section. Right. Okay. 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 So, um, we want to add in compliance. Okay. All right. Now we, I think we were at page one thirty one, right? Is that what? 131, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we ask for a third party revenue impacts. The, the question we had was whether this is duplicative of where we ask for studies um, relative, this is on page 97. So we're comparing page 97 and page 131. Uh, we asked for studies and reports showing uh, economic benefits to the region and impact on the local and regional economy, including impact on cultural institutions, small businesses, uh, et cetera. So uh, the question in 326 is obviously much more, uh, more much broader. So the question is, is that uh, seeking information that wouldn't otherwise be contained in the studies and reports? It seems to me that 326 is so broad that it's almost, it, 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 it's hard to answer. it could yield all kinds of different results that would resist side-by-side -side comparison, and, and uh, uh, 3.1 is much more focused, and we ought to go with 3.1. That, yeah, be that makes sense view. to me. Mm -hmm. All right, whatever. Okay. About 326. Uh, and then the next page, 132. Question is, do we want to uh, further or define what we mean by draw, or is that well understood? Uh, it certainly, it would seem to include a number of patrons, uh, but it also include increased business, uh, consumables, hotel bookings, etc. cetera. Uh, or, or is that term well enough understood that we can just leave it? Well, Commissioner Stebbins is really uh, responsible for that area, but if it's, um, I mean, it, the very fact that you raised the question suggests that we ought to make it more clear, right, I think. Um, yeah. With with those kinds of examples. Uh, uh, so why don't, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. As clear as we can be is certainly right. better. Uh, page 142. Um, I just, it wasn't clear exactly which objectives we were uh, inquiring about. Is it the marketing Look. strategies? Uh, the but economic plan coordination? This, this undoubtedly comes right from the matrix, right? right. So yeah. the matrix, whatever is right ab above this in the matrix probably supplies the definition. Is the previous question the one that's right above it in the matrix? Yeah, I think these I are think right so. in order. Yes, they are in the same order. Yeah. So it would be community enhancements? Well, I think that was the, the reason this was, uh, we had the question, is because the preceding question deals with basically a catch-all. Yeah, yeah it, may, it, it may refer to every, everything else in, in that section of the matrix, not just the preceding question. 
Well, why don't we, it makes sense just to hold this and take another look at the matrix. The matrix isn't here uh, now and uh, just have a discussion after the, after the meeting, after we look at that matrix and revise this question accordingly. That, that, that will be fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, page 150, I would just quickly point out uh, that we have added just a, a place where applicants can enclose any uh, types of media or, uh, or other presentations that we haven't otherwise asked for, if they're video or uh, cyber presentations or right. whatever, they, robots, they can uh, reference in there. They can reference them? Uh, reference them and tell us where they've included it, how we can access it, oh. wherever. That They're not going to be dropping off big models, are they? I, uh, see, we don't know. That's don't why know. we've included that section. Do we want that, though? Big models? Yeah. I, I don't know. Be careful what you ask for. Right. I think technology should be able to help us in this regard. Right. You know, pictures I don't and videos. So yeah. maybe we have to be specific about... We want it in electronic version, not, you know, some of the models they're rolling out at the communities. I don't know that we have room for that storage. Um, the physical model, probably we don't want, right? I mean, so I don't know I'm how you get it in the front door, some of these things. Um, They'd be assembling them. We don't. Right. Yeah. No, we don't. Right. And we'd have a construction crew come in to Yes, the we would. <laughs> right. have to have a right. rule like the airplanes, you know, right. it has to a fit in this. <laughs> Provide process. a mock-up of the project. So why don't we take, why don't we take mock-up out? But video presentation or other, or other electronic mm. uh, things, we, we, if welcome. they wanted to submit them, we'd welcome them. Yeah. Right. Commissioner. Yeah. I'll, I'll. Uh, Commissioner McHugh. I, yeah. I need a break in a little bit. You want to take a break right now? If, 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 yeah. yeah maybe, maybe a good idea. All right. Let's take a uh, five-minute break, and we'll resume and conclude this uh, in uh, in five minutes. Thank you. Sorry. All right, we're back uh, with the uh, resumption of the 69th uh, meeting, and uh, we are proceeding to the next item. Uh, Mr. Grossman. Uh, really quick, on page 193, uh, this pertains to vehicle traffic. This uh, appears to be better suited in the mitigation section. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no objection to that. Sure, we let's move, move it, it there. Over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Page, okay, page 238 through uh, 246. I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to the addition of this whole permitting section. Mm -hmm. This is consistent with the regulations where we ask them, uh, the applicants to outline all their uh, permitting plans and understanding of the process and all the MEPA uh, certificates and, and otherwise. So that's all been included here. Okay. It includes the zoning. All right. Page 258. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to this as well. Uh, this, we've, we've just beefed up the contributions section and added an a entirely new question, as you'll see on page 258, the negative advertising question. Right. This wasn't included uh, initially. The uh, 
the next section I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to is the signature section starting on page 300. I just wanted to note we put all, any anytime a statute or regulation calls for someone to agree to something or to promise or attest to uh, something, we've included uh, a page here at the back whereby we explain the situation and ask for an attestation. And that, I think, concludes all of the areas I wanted to comment on. Okay. Uh, so there, are there any uh, commissioners, uh, any further questions or, or issues that anybody wants to raise with this? We have one open question, and that's the antecedent uh, for um, these objectives in question 337 of page 142. We found the spot in the matrix, uh, but we can discuss that uh, after we get back. It, it, is, it refers to a number of different things. Um, and then we also have a number of um, uh, places where you have suggested that one question is duplicative of, of another, and it seems to me that your judgment uh, uh, ought to control, and if you think it's duplicative, you can strike them, the one that um, uh, duplicates the other. So if we uh, proceed in that fashion with that one open question to be resolved and then you resolving the others, as you see uh, fit, uh, that takes care of this. Is that right? Is there anything else that we need to do, I guess is what I'm asking. I don't think so. We'll, we'll make those changes. Uh, we certainly have to reformat some of the areas. Right. We'll have to check the numbering, the things of that uh, nature. Right. But otherwise, right. that's it. Okay. And then the plan will be to issue that uh, Monday. Will be available Monday. Do we have we, a, a target date? For I, I think we can do that. I, the plan will be that we will go back and make the changes, clean it up, get the format recirculated internally one more time, and then it should be ready for posting on Monday. Okay. All right. That's terrific. Excellent. That's a job well done. Very, very, good very well done. We get this process moving, and um, uh, then uh, publicize at the same time, in some fashion, the availability and desirability of the pre application meeting so that we can get those underway and uh, move the entire process forward in that fish. That's great. That's great. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, there is one other uh, question uh, for uh, you, uh, Ms. Blue. We had, and I don't know whether Chairman Crosby showed it to you, but he got a letter from um, the law firm that's representing Hopkinton uh, dated June 12, a recent letter, uh, suggesting uh, that there was uh, uh, some uh, previous suggestion uh, about a, um, a period of public input on the background investigations before the suitability findings were made. Um, are you familiar with that uh, at all? I'm, I'm not. Is that the letter that came in? Yesterday, it I came believe. in yesterday. I, yeah, it's dated, dated yesterday. Dated I think. Yesterday. Yeah, I reviewed it briefly. I, I wasn't entirely sure what the reference was in that letter, and I need to go back over it. He has several other questions that will need to be addressed as well. Okay, so uh, now is not the place then to discuss it since uh, you haven't had a chance really to take a look at it. Uh, our plan uh, is uh, do we have a plan, uh, Director Day, uh, that you care to discuss for dealing with the um, uh, results of the background investigations, or is that simply something we'll deal uh, with and talk about at the next meeting? Well, we I mean, the subject. Uh, I'm sure there is a plan, yeah. But we have uh, a plan on the, right. the, which is an ongoing on preparation, presentation, delivery to the commission, and, and scheduling of the appropriate uh, public meetings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's then simply uh, fold uh, addressing this question into that overall plan rather than trying to deal with it uh, today. And that's the letter of uh, June 12, 2013 from uh, uh, J. Raymond Myers of uh, Myers and Harrington uh, to Chairman Crosby, uh, okay. referring to an earlier letter that he apparently sent to you. Okay. 
Thank you, then. That does, that does uh, conclude that. Let's move, then, uh, if we might, uh, uh, to uh, item six on the agenda, which is the racing division. Mm -hmm. Director Durenberger. I should add before, as Director Durenberger is taking her seat, that once again, that may, to the uh, watching audience and even to the audience here, that last exercise may have been uh, something equivalent to watching the paint dry, but it is an essential uh, component of the way we work. Um, our decision making is, as we've said many times before, done in public. This is the time and the mechanism for making the kinds of decisions that we have to make in order to move. Uh, the Commission's business forward, and sometimes it is uh, in the fine-grained um, detail that we've just uh, been through. So, Director Durenberger, good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, or good morning, Mr. It Chair. still is, Commissioners. yeah. Commissioners, yeah. so we're getting close. Right. Um, today I have administrative updates for you. Okay. Um, I have a very brief one, a request from Suffolk Downs. They have, uh, as you know, we put names before you for approval uh, as racing officials during the 2013 race meeting. This is in addition to an earlier list. Uh, what we've done in the past is we have uh, requested your approval pending successful completion of a background check, and I would put that before you today. Um, this particular applicant, I believe, is acting as a patrol judge uh, for Suffolk, uh, probably working in the racing office in the morning. And. Uh uh, what are you seeking? Is that uh, information for us, or are you seeking some action by us on that? I am uh, requesting your approval pending successful uh, completion of a background check. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is consistent with other approvals that we've made for employees that must come before us for um, uh, for approval, so I would, you know, move that we uh, we approve this racing official, uh, Noel Rand, uh, pending that that completion of a state police background investigation. All right. Is there a second for that motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion is carried. <laughs> uh, my next order of business has to do with an item that has been in the news. Um, Within the last week, it's been a matter of some debate in the national trade publications for racing, as well as some local press. Uh, and this has to do with a state withholding, a state tax withholding. Um, the expanded Gaming Act made some changes to the existing tax law in Massachusetts. And while I'm certainly not an expert on taxation, I thought it might be helpful, since it's been in the news, to just kind of describe to you basically what is going on and what the issue is. Since it wasn't an agenda item, um, probably not subject to discussion, but I figured getting the information out there and explaining the issue might be beneficial for everybody. Surely. Um, there has been forever. Uh, although I'm sure it started at some point. A federal um, withholding type requirement, the federal law uh, can be found in 26 U.S.C. 3402Q. Uh, and what happens here is that if you are a paramutual customer and you have a win that is triggered with 300 to 1 odds or greater, uh, you do have to fill out a W-2G. Um, if your proceeds of that win exceed $5,000, it also trips a federal withholding requirement. The duty is on the licensee to um, withhold that at the time, at the point of redemption. Um, there's a federal exception for bingo, kino, and slot machine winnings. And interestingly, uh, losses are deductible up to winnings. So you can take care of all of that at the end of the year. Um, previously in Massachusetts, um, let's see. There was an exception for, quote, winnings from horse and dog racing. Uh, and the Expanded Gaming Act removed that exception. Uh, and there's a couple of other things. So what we see now in the Massachusetts chapter is that <coughs> winnings of $600 or greater uh, will trip now both the W2G requirement as well as an automatic withholding requirement, 5% uh, tax for the state. Not just, by the way, for um, winnings from horse and dog racing, but it also removed the federal exception for bingo, kino, uh, lottery tickets, and slot machine winnings as well, um, which is just interesting to me as a racing person. I think the, the gaming side is I'm, I'm starting to learn about gaming now. Um, 
under Massachusetts, the losses are not deductible the way that they are in the federal unless you meet the criteria for a trade or business as a gambler. Uh, the only thing you can deduct is the buy-in for the winning wager. So um, I put together an example if it would be helpful or if you want to ask your question before. Yeah, I, I have a question. So the Gaming Act also removed the federal exemption? Mm -hmm. that, that must no, not be. No, this is in addition to the federal, right? Yes. Okay. This just deals with this just deals with state tax. Okay. Correct. I, that was my understanding. I just yep. it's section twenty eight of the of chapter one ninety four of the statutes of two eleven. Uh, right, which amended sixty two B section two. Um, so for those of us who enjoy numbers, um, I put together an example. Um, and, and it's interesting because in the trades I'm seeing things like winning wager versus winning ticket. And um, there's been some confusion, I think, from some customers is what we're hearing about having multiple bets on one ticket. Um, really, it's we're looking at wagers. So you might have a ticket, um, and let's say that you bet 200 to win, 200 to place, and then you're going to cover yourself with a $100 show bet. Um, so you have one ticket. It's got three wagers, and it's a $500 buy-in, if you will. And let's say that the horse doesn't win, doesn't come in second, but comes in third. And his show odds were six to one. So your winning wager on that ticket pays $700, and you net 600, right? The ticket itself pays 700, but your net's only 200, because you had a $500 buy-in. Under federal law, uh, the 300 to one odds ratio has not been met, so there's no W2G reporting requirement triggered. Um, your proceeds are $5,000 or less, so the federal withholding requirement isn't triggered. And your two losing wagers plus your buy-in of $500 would be deductible against your $700 payout at the end of the year. Um, again, previously under Massachusetts law, there would have been an exception because this was a winning for horse or dog racing. Uh, so there would have been no reporting or withholding requirement. Now, however, with this exception removed, um, because you have winnings of 600, it triggers the W2G reporting requirement. And because the winnings are $600, this 5% state withholding uh, requirement is triggered. Only the $100 buy-in for the winning wager is deductible against that $700 payout. The $400 loss is not. Um, so we have some, there's some practical implications here regarding the, the point of redemption paperwork, uh, the duties on our licensees. The winning uh, paramutual customer goes to the window. He has to present his, photo, his or her photo ID as well as some proof of social security card. Uh, there's paperwork exchange between the customer and the track, and then there's paperwork exchange, of course, between the track and the Commonwealth. Um, but I think more interestingly, at least from the paramutual customer's perspective, is that difference in the, the year-end deductions. Um, because again, under federal law, the losses up to winnings can be claimed as, as itemized deductions, and under Massachusetts law, it's only that buy-in. I think that's a big deal. If you're a big player, that's a big deal. Um, and I just wonder what the implications are for the slot player, too, if you're sitting there all afternoon and you have 1000 in the machine and then you hit the $600 win, uh, you're getting taxed on what's a net loss for you. So I just I thought that was interesting. Um, so I just thought I would put that before you to explain what the issue is. And um, stay tuned, I suppose. Well, I, y yes, and this, it's, it's, uh, I think we need to be perfectly clear that this is not within our regulatory domain. This is uh, uh, the Department of Revenue. This is the taxation. This is the legislature's uh, judgment as to the appropriate uh, taxation of, uh, of uh, income. Uh, and uh, some taxation has always uh, been uh, applicable to uh, uh, to winnings, whether or not there was a deduction requirement. And this uh, is obviously a legislative uh, device designed to ensure that the taxes uh, owed are paid. Um, the exact way it plays out is how it plays out, its impact on, on, uh, uh, on, our, uh, on our domain is uh, non-existent. We just have no regulatory authority over it except to uh, make sure that people are alerted to it and that they are conforming to the rules so that the money's collected. Um, but it has, as you noted, Director Durnberg, gotten some attention uh, over the last few weeks, and, and uh, that's the backstory for it. Other discussion about that issue? No. Okay. Thank you for that uh, clarification. And? 
item B has to do with some delegation of authority. Um, Catherine, are you presenting or are yes. we? Okay. Thank you. Uh, in your materials today, there are two memos and two <coughs> resolutions. These are for delegations of authority that pertain to racing matters primarily. The first is a delegation from the Commission to the Director of Racing to allow the Director of Racing to approve things that we refer to broadly as track matters. Uh, those matters include sending notices when a licensee has failed to make required payments, executing show cause, um, making changes in post times, uh, approving a, the addition of racing personnel as you did here today, those things would be delegated to the Director of Racing. Um, and making certain changes in the racing schedule, although permanent changes in a racing schedule or an amendment of a license would come to the Commission. So this will just streamline the process of making these changes. They oftentimes come in between Commission meetings. Um, they generally are, are a very quick issue to address, and so I would ask that you approve the motion and you delegate this authority to the Director of Racing. Um. A couple of uh, weeks ago, maybe a meeting or two ago, we approved taking two days or three days out of the Suffolk schedule and putting them at the end, uh, if I recall correctly, putting them around Thanksgiving with the anticipation that ultimately they'd be dropped. Under, if I have that right, under this resolution, the movement of them to the end would be something you would do, Director Durenberger, but dropping them off would be something that the Commission would have to do. Is that, is, is that the kind of thing, the way that would work? Um, Commissioner, <coughs> Mr. Chair, I apologize. I wasn't here, for, so I wasn't part of that discussion at the previous meeting, um, but as I understood it, that actually was an amendment to the license because the license specifies the days, and so that even though it didn't change the number of race days because it changed the schedule as it appears on their license, I think that would have had to come. Oh, I see. It, at that point, it did. I think the what's contemplated under this delegation is as long as the total number of days don't change. Right. No, but when if the days were going to be dropped, lessening or shortening the schedule would have to come before the commission. Right. So that under this resolution, if we passed it, those the the, the movement of the days to a different time, a, a different day, would be something Director Durenberger could do. But that's dropping correct. them entirely would not be okay. Yep, that's right. Okay. Okay. So that is the first delegation. The second delegation is a delegation of authority to the executive director to be able to make and approve and enter into any documents that are required under 128A, Section 5H. <coughs> Section 5H lays out specific payments that need to be made. The payments are specific generally in amount. They're specific as to who they go to. Um, and so it will just make administrative sense to let the executive director review them, sign the documents, if there's a grant agreement involved, enter into it. And then, as with each of these delegations, the director of racing and the executive director, when they come before you and do the reports, they'll let you know what they've done. If they've exercised this delegation, they'll just give you an update at the next available meeting. All right. Sounds sensible. Um, any yep. I would have any questions? Yeah. I see no reason we shouldn't the approve operation. these. I would agree. Yeah. If there's a, a number of um, activity that happens day to day, so we don't want to stay in the way of that. All right. What would you like to uh, do? Um, all you need to do is move the motions that are included in your package and vote on them, and that will accomplish both delegations. Okay. All right. I, so can, I can make a motion. Please do, Mr. Commission. Chair. Uh, that uh, this commission um, delegate the request as set forth in this memorandum to delegate the director of racing the authority to approve track matters pertaining to racing licensees to ensure the efficient operation of the racing division and regulation of the racing licensees. Second. Uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 And that motion is adopted. The second one, that dealt with the delegation to Director Durenberger. That right? was, yes, for yeah. track matters. Right, for track matters. So now is there a motion with respect to the delegation to yes, uh, Executive Director? Yes, second, second motion in your material. Yes. Right. Uh, Happy to make that as well, sure, Mr. Chair, ahead. that's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
that the Commission approve a delegation of authority to the Executive Director to approve and make payments required under <coughs> Section 5H of Chapter 128A to negotiate, enter into, and execute all necessary agreements and documents to make such payments and to take all steps necessary to comply with the requirements of said section. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and that motion, too, is carried. All right. Anything else, Director Durenberger? That concludes the result. No, blue. That concludes. All right. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We haven't had a, a meeting since we had the uh, opening day ceremonies, uh, have we? That was a, a, uh, a great day to get uh, racing started uh, on the thoroughbred side. We talked about getting racing started on the, on the uh, standard bread side a while ago, and that, too, was a, a great day. But this is now uh, um, our uh, fully up-and-running racing division both with both tracks, tracks running – up and running, yeah, which is really a great accomplishment to move us forward. So, thank you for all the work you've done in getting us up and running. I think our running licensees have done this a time. Keep it right. Yeah, <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Uh, is there any further business uh, to come before the commission? Anybody have anything further? Then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned from the 69th meeting. Thank you all. Great. <laughs>